Today I want to jump into a new series, uh, and it's centered around something that I really enjoy talking about, but it's something I think that's very important for the church to understand, uh, especially in uh, this hour. And I want to talk to you about the gospel, but not just the gospel, the gospel of the kingdom. Now, if I were to ask you what is the gospel, and, 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 and if I were to ask you for a definition, I would be interested to hear what you would say. And most of us would share something about the atonement that was given to us by Jesus Christ. In other words, the fact that we are forgiven of our sins. But I want to share with you that the gospel is so much more than just that. How many of you guys know that even the word gospel literally means the good news? And when we think about the gospel, we have to think of, well, what is the good news that we have been given? What is so good about what we understand about who Jesus is? What is that good news? And I'm here to tell you today that the good news is more than just my sins are forgiven and I get to go be with the Lord in heaven someday. That there's something else that's in there. There's a whole lot of actually something else's that are in there that are good news that we need to be able to tap into. And even when we look at what, the, what Jesus and the apostles preach, we need to recognize that the good news that they shared was, was so much bigger than I think sometimes what we boil it down to. And so I want to talk a little bit today about uh, what is the gospel of God's kingdom. In other words, the good news of God's kingdom that Jesus shared, the apostles taught about, and that we read about in the Scripture. And even over these next couple of weeks, we're going to talk a little bit more about what that means and, and how that looks. But I, I, but I want to begin with this. What was the message of Jesus and the apostles? If you guys are in your notes, that's the first uh, point. But what was the message of Jesus and the apostles. This is what Jesus preached, uh, and you can see this over and over in the gospel. This is what Jesus preached in Matthew 4, 4 17. It says, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is what? At hand. So Jesus taught a, or, or preached a message of repentance, but he was preaching a, a, a message of repentance because the kingdom of God was at hand. In other words, that Jesus was coming and he was ushering in a kingdom of God. And it was a time in which people were going to be able to experience this. And so he was asking people to repent so that they might actually experience what God had intended for them from the beginning. And so Jesus taught a message, a gospel of God's kingdom coming. In Acts, uh, this is what the apostles taught in Acts 8.12. This is uh, the message that we see. It says, but when they believed Philip preaching the good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were being baptized men and women alike. And so what was the message that Philip was preaching? He preached the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. You see, uh, it, it, in his time, after Jesus had resurrected and ascended, they were not only just talking about the kingdom coming, but they were tying that in to knowing Jesus. And so the message that he preached was the kingdom of God had come and Jesus Christ was ushering that in and that they could receive that kingdom. And then they were what? They were baptized into this kingdom, weren't they? Do you know that there are over a hundred times in the New Testament that it is taught about the kingdom of God coming or that the kingdom of God was something that we should experience and over 80% of those uh, scripture verses, those references are found in the Gospels. This was something that was so desperately important for Jesus and the apostles to teach because God was doing something here on earth that He had never done before. The time to which 
everything had been promised in the Old Testament was coming into fruition because of what Jesus had just done and what the Holy Spirit was doing in the lives of those early believers. Something had shifted. And so there is this discussion in the New Testament about kingdoms. And I think that we need to understand that there, there's an importance of what God is ushering in in terms of kingdom because the enemy had already established his kingdom here on earth. And how many of you understand that if you look in the Old Testament that they were bound under the weight of the enemy's kingdom? Satan came and he established a kingdom on earth and most of us have lived under the yoke of his kingdom. Most of us, that is the reference point to which we understand. We understand how the world works and if you understand the world, you understand that the world is under the authority of the enemy. And what do you think Jesus came to do? To break that yoke to usher in a new age where we didn't have to live under the weight of sin and we didn't have to live under the weight of the enemy manipulating us. That we could live according to a new way that wasn't led by the flesh, but is led by the Spirit of God. What does the enemy want to do? He wants to establish a a counter kingdom, a counterfeit kingdom on earth. And it has been his desire to usurp the authority of God from day one. We understand from the Scripture that that the enemy, that Satan himself had been an archangel and and had uh, basically rebelled against God. And in doing so, he took with him other angels and tried to establish his own authority, his own kingdom, his own power. And he did so uh, basically spiting God himself and saying, I'm going to do it better than than you of course we know that that's not really the way that it turned out right but there has been this war that has waged ever since and we are the objects of that war are we not and so in that there is this constant pulling and tugging between the enemy's counterfeit culture and counterfeit kingdom and God's true kingdom. I want to go back to Genesis for a moment because I want you to understand you know, a lot of times we, 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 we see things through the lens and you know, we have to be careful about how we do answer what is the gospel because how you answer the gospel is going to determine how you follow God. If it's only about atonement, then your sins are forgiven. You continue to go on living the way that you want to live, only now your sins are forgiven so you're off the hook. If we understand that God is trying to establish a new way of living, a new kingdom here on earth, then we recognize there are things that I'm to be doing inside of what God is establishing, correct? So even when we look at Scriptures, we're going to jump into Genesis chapter 1 towards the end of that particular chapter. But even when we look at verses like this, if our answer is only that Jesus came to deal with our sins, if that's how we want to see everything, then that lens actually puts us in the place of merely just seeing the fact that man and, and uh, Adam and Eve, man and woman, had sinned in the garden, and so God was dealing with that sin. But there's something bigger that happens in this moment, and I want to just make you aware of it. And this is what it says in Genesis chapter 1, verses 28 through 30. It said, God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth, and do what? And subdue it, and rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Then God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the surface of the earth, and every tree which has fruit yielding seed, it shall be food to you. And so every beast of the earth 
uh, and to every uh, bird of the sky and to everything that moves on the earth which, is, or which has life, I have given every green plant for food, and it was so. Now here is really what is going on in the garden. What did God give humanity? Not just a really cool place to live. Now, and most of us, when we read that, we think about how awesome it would be to be able to live in a paradise like God had created for man and for woman to live in. And so we think about that and we think about paradise lost, don't we? We think about the fact that when they sinned, they were kicked out of the garden no longer to experience that. And we recognize that because of that sin, that we no longer get to experience that. And I've had conversations even with my kids where it's like, hey, you know, wouldn't it be so cool if Adam and Eve had never sinned? Have you ever had that conversation? And we were all just living happy in the garden and everything was wonderful and hunky-dory. And we recognize that where we're going, the hope that we have is that God is going to recreate a new heaven and a new earth and someday we will be resurrected to live and enjoy the way that it was always meant to be. So guess what? It would have been nice if they hadn't sinned, but because of Jesus, we're all going to get to experience that through Him. So that's a part of what we look forward to. But God gave something to mankind in this moment. And the sin wasn't just Satan going and trying to mess things up with mankind. The sin was about something bigger. What God had given humanity was dominion and authority over all of His creation. Y'all jump in with me a little bit this morning. But, but, but God had given authority, dominion over all created things. And what did Satan want? That very thing, didn't he? And so when Satan comes in and he he, he tempts mankind, it's not just to even snub God or to, to do something like that. It was because what he wanted was he wanted to steal the dominion that had been given to mankind and by causing them to sin, he disrupted that dominion, he disrupted that authority, and he took it for himself. And He established His kingdom on earth. And guess what? His kingdom is set up to only be about Him. And in the process, take what He wanted. He saw what God had. He saw that God had created all things. That He had uh, dominion and authority over all things. And I believe that He was even jealous that God looked past Him. And looked to humanity and said, I will give you this beautiful gift. And so, we have to recognize something in this. The reestablishing, the good news, if we go back to what is that good news? The good news about the kingdom is that God is taking away that authority from Satan. And He's returning it back to us. He's taking what had been lost and He's making it new and He's refreshing it and He's restoring it. Jesus did not come to deal with sin just so that our sins were forgiven and we can have eternity. Jesus came to deal with our sins so that we can freely live for Him and according to what He's establishing here on earth. I want to read a passage of Scripture to you. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4. It says this, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of what? We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. And here's something that you need to understand. 
We were born into a war that is waged between the enemy and the God that we serve. And when God reestablished His kingdom and gave us authority, it wasn't just so that we can walk around and go, oh, I have authority, and look at all the things that I can do because God loves me, and it's not about claiming this and doing that. It's all about reestablishing God's ways on earth and tearing down what the enemy has established here on earth. Y'all need to get more excited about that. How many of you, and I'm just asking you this question, you don't have to raise your hand and you don't have to say anything, but how many of you at one point were living under the weight of the enemy and the sin that had corrupted your life? And when you look out there, how many people do you see who are living underneath the weight of sin and, and, and again, the enemy's uh, 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 influence over them and even over the culture? And if you just look out over the culture, can't you even see how the culture is slipping away from God as they reject Him boldly and choose to live for themselves? You were saved You were forgiven of your sins. You were given freedom in Christ Jesus. Not just so you can say, I am forgiven. Not just so you say, I have a hope. But because God is wanting to actively reignite His church, His people, to go out and to do something that will transform the landscape of the world that is around us. And so many of us, we look out there and we lament and we say, oh, the world is going crazy. And and how many of you, I mean, I was just having a conversation this week. I said, I'm either praying for revival or the trumpet. (laughs) One of those two things is what I'm looking for to happen here soon. But the truth is, and what God wants us to get at, is the fact that We are here to establish His rule, His reign, His kingdom here on earth. And if that's our mission, and that's what God is supporting and supplying for, why do we think, why do we lament, why do we look out there and we feel like giving up? Why? We should look out there and we should see what's going on on out there and recognize God has given me the authority to go break these things in Jesus' name. God has given me authority to push the enemy back and to establish His ways right here on earth. What do you think Jesus meant when He prayed? He said, they said, well, teach us how to pray. And He says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He asked us to pray that because that's the mission that He called us to. That's what He wants out of the church. That's what, he's, that's what the Gospel is all about. That His kingdom would come. That His will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. I don't know about you, but I would imagine that His kingdom is pretty darn pure in heaven. I would imagine that all of His power is represented in heaven. As a matter of fact, I would imagine if you stepped foot into the throne room of God right now, you would be blown away by the purity and the power and the authority that God has. And what God has called us into, what God has said to us, is pray in this way. Why do we pray in that way? Because we're asking for God to do what He has done right here, right now. We're asking Him to come with all of His power, all of His authority, everything that He has to offer to come right now in this moment and to bring it. But again, if all you're worried about is God forgave me of my sins, you're never going to be looking to God to say, let's do something. Let's establish your kingdom here, right now on earth. In power and in glory. Y'all need to get more excited. Jump up again. Do you understand what a stronghold is? There's so many ways I can go with this. But just from 
just from the perspective, just from a, a basic definition, a stronghold is a place that has been established by somebody as a place of authority, of a place of power. It is hard to defeat. It is hard to destroy. It is hard to take down. It is intentionally designed to be a seat of power and it is intentionally designed to be a place of strength. The kind of place that when you look at, you go, there's no way we can take that stronghold. And some of us feel that way right now. And the words that it uses get translated in that verse out of Corinthians where it says, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses or strongholds. Do you recognize? We need to start recognizing this as a church, as a people, that when God reestablished His kingdom and He gave you back the authority to which was stolen because of sin, when He gave that back to you, what He gave you the power to do was to literally stand up to strongholds and to tear those suckers right down. There is nothing too big or powerful that the enemy has established here on earth that His church was not equipped to tear apart. But you have to start looking. The gospel of the kingdom is God has dealt with sin. God is tearing down strongholds. God is calling me into the place of joining and partnering with Him to see His kingdom spread on earth. Going back to the Scripture in the garden, there were three things, and I've said this before, it's not the first time I've ever preached this, but there were three things that were robbed that day in the garden. If we talk about, well, what is the kingdom, we need to understand what three things were stolen on that day or destroyed on that day. One, our relationship with God. Do you understand that in the garden they walked with God every day? That there was no division. You know, we live in a world where we go, where is God? That's always the question, isn't it? Where is God? And that's the accusation of those who do not believe. Where is God? Because they can't feel Him. They can't see Him. They can't taste Him, right? All the, the different things that we think about, the, the, the way that we experience the world around us. But in those days, God was with man and there was no division. There was no separation. There was none of that. But when we sinned and we gave up our authority and we did all those things, then there was division between us and God. The second thing is this, our relationship to each other. How many of you understand that the first fight happened when God said, where, is, where are you guys in the garden? And what was, what was Adam's thing? His thing was, this woman you gave me tempted me. And her thing was, I don't have a big enough closet for all these fig leaves. No, I'm just kidding. No, but the blame game started that moment, right? And there was the first argument right there in the garden. There was division. There was supposed to be harmony and beauty between them in their relationship. This was meant to be a relationship that was pure and there was none of the junk that we understand that comes in uh, as we live our lives and as we struggle sometimes to connect with one another. But what happened in the garden was there was a division created between each other. And there was also a division that was created between us and God's creation. And in the world out there, there's all kinds of people that are trying to resolve these problems. You understand that pretty much most of what mankind does in the world today is to try to resolve one of these kinds of problems. But when the kingdom comes... When the kingdom is established in our lives, these things get brought back into alignment. And God can reestablish things the way that they were meant to be. So when God brings healing 
Because that's what it's all about. Do you guys know that the word for salvation is the word sozo in Greek? And do you understand that that word doesn't even just mean salvation, sins, that kind of a thing. It literally means to make whole your whole entire person, your body, your mind, your soul. When, it, when, when, when they talk about salvation in the New Testament, what they're talking about is the complete healing of who you are. And that's a beautiful message. But the intent of God's kingdom is to restore what was lost, to rescue from sin, and to heal from sickness. Do you know anybody who doesn't need any one of those things? So when we think about God's kingdom, when we think about the good news. What we're talking about is God doing something with us that is so amazing, it is supernatural, and it reestablishes God's kingdom here on earth in a way that represents His heavenly realms. And I will say that one of the issues I think that we struggle with in church in the Western culture is that we've just boiled everything down to just simply atonement. Come and get saved. But what are you getting saved to? What happens next? Do you understand that there is a responsibility that has been given to you? Do you recognize that there is something that you yourself are supposed to be carrying and doing? And I believe, and I'm, I've, I've, I've mentioned this before, but I think the church has become impotent not because we don't have power from on high, but because we don't call it down. And we don't choose to live in it. I was talking just even this morning with somebody and they were talking about how God had clearly spoke to them in a moment just this past week to talk to somebody about Jesus. And they knew it was the Lord and they knew it was the Holy Spirit and then they shared the story of what happened in that and it was a beautiful story. But then they made the comment, I just wish that everybody could hear from the Holy Spirit and do what the Lord is asking them to do. If we answer the question of what is the gospel with I'm saved, then we literally cut short everything else God wants to do in our life from that point forward. And I want to be a church that's on fire for Him. I want to be a church that understands what we've been given I want to be a church that doesn't take those things for granted. I want to be a church that's alive in the Holy Spirit. And I want us to catch a glimpse of what God's kingdom can do in the world around us. Because I can guarantee you, once the kingdom of God gets moving, there ain't nothing that can get in its way. Now, they may try, and they may push back, and they may say things, but God, I believe, has way more authority than the devil. Amen? And that's part of the good news, too. So this is what we're going to do this morning. We're just going to close with a word of prayer. I'm going to have the uh, worship team come on. or not worship team. The prayer team come on up. You guys just freaked out for a moment, didn't you? He was like, man, I didn't know I had to sing a song. <laughs> we're going to have the prayer team come on forward. And I'm just going to ask you to do this this morning. Or I'm going to ask you this question. Do you bear the kingdom? Are you ready to shine that light? Or are you just satisfied with saying I'm forgiven? 
And I would ask you this morning if you want to come forward, to come forward for one of these reasons. One, maybe you need to establish a relationship with Jesus. Maybe you've never given your life to Jesus this morning. You need to come forward and you need to do that. If you have uh, maybe given your life to Jesus, but you've sort of gotten yourself distracted by the world and worldliness and you just need to kind of get yourself back, please come forward and get yourself going this morning in the right direction. Some of you may just need to say, you know what, I said yes to Jesus forgiving my sins, but I never said yes to really living for the Lord. Maybe this morning you need to come forward and just say, God, I surrender everything at your feet and I choose to live according to your ways. Some of you may just need to come up this morning, you just need some prayer over whatever it might be. I don't know, it could be something significant that's going on in your life, it could be something you're dealing with, it could even be something medically or financially or whatever it is. Please come forward and allow them to pray over you this morning. Don't walk out of here with the same burden on your shoulders that you walked in with. So we're going to close with a word of prayer. And if you guys would stand and take this opportunity for the Lord to do something in your life. Lord, we thank you this morning. We give you glory and honor. We recognize, Lord, that you, the good news of what you've done in our lives is so much more, so much deeper than just we're saved. Lord, I pray that we might seriously look at what it is you're calling us to carry. How we might share the good news with people, but more specifically, that we might take that authority that has been given to us by your Spirit. We might tear down strongholds that the enemy has established. And Lord, that we might see freedom in people's lives in Jesus' name. Lord, help us to just even catch a vision. Because I think for most of us, we don't even know what that looks like. So help us, Lord, to see through your eyes what you're doing in this hour. In Jesus' name, amen.